And Lord, I continue to worship as we um, just transition to this next point in our service. Lord, we're so thankful for the cross. We're thankful for Jesus, the center of it all. Uh, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. We do that this morning, Lord, uh, verbally and uh, in our hearts and in our prayers and through song. But we pray that you'd help us to do that this week in our attitudes and actions. And all we say and do, we, may we confess him as Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Welcome here again. If you're just joining us, my name is Pastor Jeremy. I'm so glad you're here to worship with us today. Thanks to all our volunteers and support, our ER team, and everybody else who's keeping us safe and working great today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I have a question for you. It's Obviously, we're experiencing uh, COVID, each of us differently, depending on our circumstances. But one of the things we share is that we've probably run into something in the grocery store or somewhere else that we thought would be there that wasn't. Amen? And some of those things are pretty obvious, like, for example, Lysol wipes. But there are some that I certainly did not expect. And while you are socially distanced really well this morning, and some of you are far away, so I can't do it quite the same as we normally would, I am interested in a little audience interaction today because I've been deprived of that for months. So help me out here and fill up my audience interaction tanks. That would be great. I am interested in the oddball things that you have encountered, whether grocery store or wherever else, and you're like, what? We're out of that? Go ahead, shout it out. What is it? Ziploc bags. There's one. What's another? Whoops. Let's go with female first. Who said it? Ramen noodles? What? What else? What? What did you say? Wow, Dave knows some electrical thing that is all gone. Okay, what else? What'd you say? Canned pears? What? No canned pears, that's terrible. What else? What? Tapioca? That reminds me. This is a very important story. Vitamin D gummies are made with tapioca. That's why they taste so good. You know what is all gone right now? Vitamin D gummies. It's been tough. What'd you say, Kyle? Graham crackers. All right. Anything else just for kicks? Yeast. Why in the world are we all out of yeast? I don't know. Someone told me fence post and other contractors said he's having trouble finding supplies. All these weird things not showing up. But here we are in the middle of this strange epidemic that we have never faced before. My son is not a coin collector. I once attempted to be and then didn't do so very successfully. But one of the things I learned through that endeavor was that in World War II, many of the coins were no longer made out of um, copper or the typical metals because they were being used in the war manufacturing industry and so you'll see these nickels during that time that are made out of a different metal or you'll see pennies or other things made differently in specific wartime rationing. I can remember after September 11th feeling a bit dis disoriented and disheveled and I spoke with my grandma who was around during that time of World War II and she didn't really have a lot to say other than the typical grumpy grandma sort of thing, no offense, but she was like, Ugh, we made it through World War II, we'll make it through this. I was like, okay, well thanks, Gramps. I mean, at least there's some perspective there, right? Like, there's been hard times before, there'll be hard times ahead, and whatever we're going through now, God will get us through, it'll be okay. And so we look at World War II and we look at disasters and we look at shortages and we look at other things and we seem to understand there's a path forward. Like if there's a flood, eventually we know what to do. We got to get the water out and the drywall out and then we got to gut it and then repair it and rebuild it and shore it up and do our best. Like there's action steps we can take in order to move forward. 
But what about when you face an invisible, microscopic, uncontrollable enemy? What do we do? How should we respond to COVID-19? Unfortunately, there's no one here old enough to say, we made it through the Spanish flu, we'll do it again. Or we made it through the Black Plague, we'll do it again. But instead, there is something older even than Grandma herself, and that is the Word of God. And better than Grandma is the Holy Spirit Himself. So I invite you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 17, beginning in verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. We will not have the words up on the screen for you, but I will read them for you, so listen carefully or follow along in your Bibles. Jeremiah 17, 5. Jeremiah 17, 5 says this. Thus says the Lord, the Lord, not Grandma, the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in the man and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in the uninhabited salt land. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought. For it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in this chapter, in this text, this particular poetic little section, what's happening is Jeremiah is making his point via an analogy or a metaphor, a comparison, a word picture. And that word picture, of course, is a tree. We're outside. You see trees. You know how it works. If there's a river and the tree is next to the river, the roots go down into the river and that sustenance that nutrient the water provides that tree life so that even when it is hot even when it is dry that tree still thrives when the heat comes in the picture the word picture of drought when all the grass is yellow when everything else is brown and dying that tree is still doing well i believe that coronavirus or covid19 is like that drought it is a time where the heat is on. Our culture has come to a boiling point and everything is coming up to the surface. Things we have tried to sweep under the rug for a long time have been quickly and disgustingly revealed. People are polarized, relationships are strained, and some are indeed breaking, even in immediate families. 2020 we might call the year of COVID or the year of the drought. Shutdown, social distancing, isolation, lack of community, no doubt many of us have felt parched. So what then do we do? You've seen yard signs perhaps giving you advice. Let's band together. After the flood, for example, I saw articles in the newspaper after great acts of charity and service. People would say things like, this has restored my faith in humanity. Faith in humanity? Wait a minute. What did I just read? Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Cursed is the man who trusts in the man and makes flesh his strength. Faith in humanity. I don't think that's where the Bible wants us to go. If nothing else, I think this time has shown us that indeed the Bible is true. People are wicked. People are sinful. And we do need help. 
flip on any social media and you'll indeed find evidence of that fallen humanity. The unredeemed heart hates. Unredeemed humanity hates. As I've watched this develop more than ever, at least in my experience, I've seen the effects of hatred. And what I see are that hatred needs an object. It needs a target. It needs something to go after. And so inevitably, convinced of our own self-righteousness or positions or whatever else, we will tend to polarize those who oppose us. And we will look at that other position and all of a sudden it becomes the object of our animosity and a good target to blame for all of the problems. If it just weren't for them or if if I were there we would do different or my group this or blah, 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 blah and all of a sudden people are just at it. Ed Stetzer in a book he wrote in 2019 before all of this calls this Um, Christians living in an age of outrage. It is a time in which some people have called it the cancel culture. You don't associate with someone based on your affinities, but instead you decide who to associate based on who you oppose. And if they're throwing rocks at the same people I want to throw rocks at, then I'm on their team. There is no hope in humanity. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful. Disney wants to tell you, follow your heart. Don't. I say, by all means, do not follow your heart. It will trick you into believing that you are 100% right and in no need of help or correction. The Bible says the exact opposite. But here's the thing. If I just stop there, it's all doom and gloom and we're depressed and discouraged and we look at the world and we go blah yuck but we who are bible believing christians of all people we have hope we understand that this is the way it is that's the way the bible tells us it shouldn't be a surprise why are we surprised when this stuff happens the bible says it would and so despite the wars and rumors of war and division and everything else the church holds on to hope. We have something that nobody else in the entire world has. Lots of people can do good deeds. But we have something that nobody else has. We have the life-saving, world-changing power of Jesus Christ. Nobody else has that. Despite all the muck, we can say with confidence that God is good, God is in control, and Jesus wins. We actually have the cure. Not just to corona, but to everything. So what then do we do? Well, first of all, we hold on to hope. We hold on to hope as a church, because we have Jesus, because we have the death, burial, and resurrection, we have hope. But I know that this morning, that's important. We need to build ourselves up. But there's probably some more specific questions. I want to address a couple of those. Oops, and I forgot to set my timer. So hang on. I want to address a couple of those in the next few moments. Um, Questions like, how do we relate to our government? What do we do with others who disagree with us? And how do we maintain our spiritual, mental, and emotional health. Now, obviously, each of those could be individual sermons in and of themselves, but I want to give you some general rules of thumb. There's always exceptions. There's always adaptations. But this is a general idea of how I think we should approach this situation. So, first of all, our government. And I want to ask the question, is there ever a time in which we should disobey? Is there ever a time in which we should disobey our government? Yes. Right now, up until this point, we've worked really hard to uh, accommodate and to be complementary to what our leaders are trying to do. But we do, at some point, have to ask ourselves, at what moment or where has the government 
exceeded their authority and crossed the line. When do we fight for liberty and when do we lay down our lives? When do we submit and when do we practice civil civil disobedience? What constitutes God-ordained authority and what constitutes God usurping authority? These are the questions I think we as Americans are wrestling with now more than we've ever had to wrestle with in the past. Even so, I feel pretty good about being here. I'm up here proclaiming Jesus on a stage with no fear whatsoever. There's not minders wandering around in our audience seeking to arrest me and talk to me afterwards. There's not terrorists walking down that path and thinking about walking in here and blowing up. We're still worshiping in relative peace and freedom together here as one body. But at what point do we begin to disobey? As I look at the Bible, there are only um, probably less than a dozen different instances of civil disobedience. I walked through those at our business meeting as we met in the parking lot on the other side. Each and every one of those that I could find, I couldn't find any more. But then as I was looking at them again this week, I realized there are basically three big categories. Three big categories. You don't have to remember all the different instances, but where in the Bible, what types of situations do people intentionally disobey government leaders? And the first big category is life and death. In life and death situations, we see disobedience. For example, the Hebrew midwives who hid the babies that were about to be aborted or murdered. The prophet Obadiah, who hid 100 prophets during the wicked Queen Jezebel's reign. Elisha, when he lied to the Arameans, who were attempting to surround his dwelling and kill him. And Esther and Mordecai, when they averted the genocide. All of these are direct approaches to disobeying government authority, and it all has to do with life and death. And you might even raise it up a level and say, actually, it's genocide, because when you talk about 100 prophets, or all the baby boys, or the entire community of Jews, you're actually not even talking about one individual at that point. You're talking about large groups. So in theory, as one individual, you could easily choose to lay down your life and become a martyr, and you still might not have a case for disobedience. But in each of these cases, what I see is large group genocidal murder. The biblical narrative demonstrates that they disobeyed, and it praises that disobedience. Another of which, of course, we know, um, the fiery furnace. Eden, who was in the fiery furnace? Do you remember? You got it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Jesus showed up after a little bit too, didn't he? So, in other words, if we are forced to worship someone other than God, that is a great time to say no and disobey. That's one of the stories we teach our children from the time they're really tiny. If someone causes you to worship another God, you're supposed to say no. No one's doing that to me today. Another one that is interesting, so so far we have basically life and death, and we have worshiping another God. The third category, which some of you may be surprised by this, I would say is actually marriage. It's marriage. Um, John the Baptist spoke out against Herod and condemned publicly this politician's marriage. Now, as a result, he got his head cut off. So be careful what you say. Of course, it may end poorly for you, if you will, but marriage is an example of something that the Bible, Jesus, actually praises John for being one of the most righteous men on the planet. So then, speaking out on marriage is important. And finally, gospel proclamation. We see Jesus, Peter, John, Paul, and Silas, all of them enduring suffering, imprisonment, and martyrdom on account of their proclamation of the gospel. So really, the big categories that the Bible shows us is genocide, life and death, worshiping other gods, marriage, and gospel proclamation. If any of those are being infringed upon, by all means, defiantly disobey. So what about mask? That's a big one, isn't it? The Bible doesn't talk about mask. So what do we do? I know I've just stepped onto a mine, and as soon as I take my foot off, 
one direction or the other is probably going to blow up on me. But I'm just going to go for it. Um, here's the thing. Our governor said to wear a mask. People have um, reasons at times why they can't wear a mask. And for whatever reason, it seems that the people who want to wear a mask and the people who are unable or don't, whatever the case may be, I'm not making a judgment or anything like that, have begun to go at each other, even in the church. And that is not what Jesus would have us to do. Jesus wants us to show our love for one another and be united and not let something like a mask divide us. And so in this case, while we have no um, biblical mandate, each of us is going to have to prayerfully consider where we're at. And we will inevitably come to a conclusion. We will decide something. And no doubt, even in this group right here this morning, there will be difference of opinion. And that's part of the reason right now we're outside is because it allows you to express your opinion in whichever way you want, safely. Mask, no mask. But when we go back in in October, which is our plan, then it gets tricky. And we recognize that. We're not oblivious to the reality of the heat of the confrontation, despite what some have said. And so what then do we do? Well, if you are someone who has a medical reason for not wearing a mask, let me say, we love you. God loves you. We accept you. You are welcome. Did you hear that? If you have a medical exemption, we are not going to call your doctor and verify that. We accept you. We love you. You are most welcome. Similarly, if you feel strongly that masks are essential and important, and you want to wear them, by all means, wear them. And we are not going to condemn you for that either. But what we really don't want is for this person here and this person here to turn and start looking at each other and throwing stones. That's not okay. And yes, we're going to have to figure out how we do this. And it's tricky because what the Bible tells us to do is to lay down our lives and lay down our rights on behalf of others. That's Jesus' example. Jesus is enthroned in heaven, and he came down here to this same disgusting muck that we live in today. And his was worse. Jesus lived under Nero. And despite how some may feel, Nero was worse than anything we have in power today. Jesus lived under Nero. I never heard him go after Nero. But I know this. He laid down his rights. He laid them down. And to say that as an American, we're like, no, my rights. You know what we have a right to? Hell. We have a right to hell and nothing else. Anything better than that is called grace. And when we let our American ideals overcome the scriptural truth, we have made a mistake. The Bible tells us that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. It's hard to get to heaven, and the only way is through Christ on his merit alone. So when we sit here and we stomp our feet and we demand our rights, that is not the right thing to do. So what do we do then as a church? Because one side might say, hey, lay down your rights for me because that's a biblical thing to do. And the other side might say, no, you lay down your rights for me because that's a biblical thing to do. And we're stuck. They're mutually exclusive positions. And we can't make everybody happy exactly right. We're sorry it's not possible. We are doing our very best through outdoor services, through live streaming, through everything we've done to bring glory to God. And we promise as an elder board that our intent is not to be divisive. But here is our desire from the beginning to please God, bless our community, 
walk in wisdom, follow by faith, and trust God for the outcome. And it's funny to me how some people assign either side a lack of faith. I've heard people say that if you don't do it one way, if you're not wearing a mask, you're not laying down your rights. I've heard other people say if you're wearing a mask, you don't have faith. No. Look, as a pastor, as a church, it actually requires more faith to stop meeting inside than it does to go back inside. Inside is comfortable, inside is known, inside is predictable, inside is easy. We've done it before, we know how it works. But outside every week, we're looking at the radar, we're praying to God, we're hoping it's going to work, we hope people don't go away, we hope this, we hope that, blah, blah, blah. It's scary. This path that we've chosen is not the easy or the most expedient one. It's the difficult one. And as such, I believe that it is indeed the path of faith. So I've kind of gone all over the place, but let me bring it back in. The big categories is we have government, civil disobedience, others, what do we do, and mental and emotional health, and that's a big one too. Um, how do we deal with our emotions, anxiety, fear, anger, depression, frustration, exhaustion? How do we deal with people when we disagree? Well, you know the common human tendency, it's either fight or flight. And how much have you seen that? Either all of a sudden someone cuts you off and you're done, or they're going at you hardcore. Like, whoa. Neither of those are Christian. That is not Matthew 19. Matthew 19 tells you to go to that person, not post about that person on Facebook, but go to that person. How do we do this? How do we work towards reconciliation? There's a lot of stuff going on here, but at the end of the day, the Bible is telling us to hold out hope. To hold out hope. Even if we disagree, hold out hope. The church holds out hope. We have the cure. And we, as your leadership team, are not condemning you, whether you're on one side of the fence or the other. We love you, we welcome you, we respect you, and we're going to do our very best come October to make it possible for as many people as possible to worship in the ways that works for them, whether that's mask or no mask. We're going to work on it. We're committed to that. Watch this afternoon as an email will come out with more information. But for now, let me give you some very practical, detail-oriented um, recommendations to help you wrestle through, as we all are, those issues that I just brought up a moment ago. Uh, my first recommendation is this. Read Christianity Today. That's my first recommendation. Read Christianity Today. What? That's as profound as you get? Yes. You know why? Because it's not CNN, Fox, or Facebook. Okay, and inevitably, I can tell you which side of the debate you're on, depending on which one of those you're going after. Where are you getting your news from? What is your source? Here's the thing. Christianity Today, I can by no means support all of their theological positions. I do not agree with every author. There are many that I would say, whoa, they are way off the charts. But they are broad. They are so broad that by reading them, you're going to come away with perspective. Not just from our local community, not just from our state, but from the entire world. They're interviewing Christians in other countries and pastors in other places and seeing how they deal with these same issues. And so it opens our eyes a little bit to get off our myopic view of my own little life. And everything I've read from them on COVID and others, COVID in particular, is excellent. It's really, really good. So just Google Christianity Today and Ed Stetzer and COVID and find some balance, find some perspective. Help, un help yourself understand the bigger picture and the broader issues and how it relates not just to my politics or not just to my work, but to Christ and his gospel and the eternal plan. We are indeed living in an age of outrage and we need balance desperately. So number one, read CT. Get your news from a Christian source. 
You're Christians. Start with Christian news. Number two, I would actually recommend making a mass exit from Facebook. I would say get off social media. It's come to the point where it's a complete waste. At one point in time, it was a nice little way to share pictures with mom and dad. And then it moved into a place to share my opinions. And now it's moved into a place of terrible, terrible, terrible bullying, international espionage, pornography, hatred, and everything else. There's literally lawsuits out there from employees who worked at Facebook suing Facebook because their job was to moderate content and they came away with PTSD. I'm saying... Spend more time with your family and friends, your real ones, than your fake ones. Those fake ones will unfriend you in five minutes if they read the wrong thing. They're not your friends. Get off Facebook. Number two. Number three, fight or flight. I'd say whatever you do, go directly to the source. Go directly to the source. Go to the source. Have the conversation. Be courageous. Yes, it's more difficult. Yes, you'll mess up. But go to the source. If you got an issue with somebody, go talk to them. Don't talk to someone else about the issue. Number four, pray for your leaders. Pray. Just pray, pray, pray. Even if you don't like them, even if you didn't vote for them, even if you'd never vote for them again, pray. The Bible tells you to pray for your leaders, even if they're Nero. Pray. Number five, talk to your elders. We want to talk to you. Like when we say at the bottom of an e email, reach out, talk to an elder. Guess what? We mean it. We wouldn't put it there if we didn't. It's not a random thing at the bottom just for kicks, but we actually want to interact with you. We value you. We love you, and we want to help. So feel free to reach out. If you have questions, talk to us. And number four was pray for your leaders. Um, number five was talk to your elders. Number six... Let's pray some more. Number four was pray. Number five, something else. Number six, pray some more. And finally, number seven, as it gets hot, and I'm getting ready to go too, so don't worry. Identity. Identity. This is a big one I think we're really wrestling with. Identity. I think this one is huge. Listen to this statement. Ready? We are citizens of heaven first and citizens of the United States second. We are citizens of heaven first, and citizens of the United States second. I understand that we love our country. I love our country. But we absolutely must love our kingdom more. Kingdom over country. I think there was someone who once said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Something like that. We are citizens of heaven first, citizens of the United States second. So as you go throughout your week this week, ask yourself these questions. Number one, are my words positive? Are they wholesome? Are they uplifting? How is my attitude? Is it negative or is this just a rant? And number three, if I did decide to stay on Facebook, am I just stirring the pot or am I promoting peace? Am I stirring the pot or am I promoting peace? And then finally, let me answer this one as much as I can without knowing everything about the future. What about our church? What about us right here as a group? As a church, you must know that our intentions are to please God, bless the community, walk in wisdom, follow by faith, and trust God for the outcome. I understand that other churches are going to do things differently. We know that. In fact, there was one article I read on a ministerial alliance where the community got together and said, okay, churches, let's not compete against each other. Let's all reopen on the same Sunday. We're committed to that. Yes. And then they couldn't do it. It was impossible. There's 
too many differences between all the little churches and variables and factors to even make that happen. Each church is going to have to decide for themselves what God is calling them to do and then follow in faithfulness. There will be a lot of similarities, but none will be the same. And ours is going to be different because we're not them. It's like every one of your kids is different. Every one of your family is different. Every little church is different. It's going to be different. So we believe that no matter what, God is good, God is in control, and Jesus wins. And therefore, the church holds on to hope. Our church's plan, as much as possible, is to be here in this place until the weather gets bad, which we're assuming is October. And in October, we're going to go inside one way or the other, regardless of the executive order. That's our plan. And the reason is, is because we've tried hard to do everything we can to work with our local officials and the community and state as long as we can. But at some point, there's the physical health and there's the spiritual and emotional health. And while at the start we are told it's going to be short, it's going to be like this, it'll be okay, it's dragged on, and now we've got to the point where we're like, hmm, this part is starting to outweigh this one. And our hospital's doing okay, and locally our curve is flat, and so it's different in every place, but we think we're moving into the position to be able to go back inside, do it safely with all the precautions we've set up. So our plan is for October, and my plan is to be here every Sunday and just enjoy God's beautiful creation out here on the lawn, breathing the fresh air. Inside, by the way, our air exchange is 20%. Out here, it's quite a bit better than that. We've already looked into these details. We've examined our HVA system and everything else, and we believe that we're on the right path for doing our very best to keep you safe, to continue to worship, to build into your lives and to balance the tensions that exist that the Bible doesn't necessarily spell out in precise detail. And that's why we walk in what we believe is wisdom and faith. But either way, admitting we're not perfect and we make mistakes along the way, no matter what, we hold on to hope. The church holds on to hope because God is good, God is in control, and Jesus wins. So let me conclude this time then um, since there are no words from Grandma with Jesus' words, I think he's old enough to say that everything's going to be okay. Matthew chapter 24, signs of the end. It says, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, oh, that's outside. <laughs> the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. They didn't have Facebook, but they had a lot of opinions. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my sake. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many, listen to this, the love of many will grow cold. Have you seen that? But, verse 13, here's the big one. The one who endures to the end will be saved. We hold on to hope. Yes. All these things will come. Yes. Many will be divided. Yes, brother, sister, mother, father, they will hate each other. Jesus said so. But the church holds on to hope because the one who endures to the end will be saved. Father, we thank you for your promise. Lord, we thank you for your word. 
Oh, Lord, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but you do. And you promised, God, that these things would come. And we ask that you would help us to endure. Help us to love one another, Lord. Help us to be willing to reconcile. Help us to be encouragers that build up the body even when we disagree. Lord, give us your grace. Give us your strength. Forgive us for when we mess up, when we react in anger, or we feel anxious or worried and we fail to trust you. Lord, no matter what, help us to love one another and hold on to hope. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.